joining us and Amy, Kara, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, we are happy to be back with you all, albeit virtually, and um, want to talk with you today about uh, training staff, the who and the what. And we are going to talk about prevention and training as an element of prevention in the context of campus sexual violence. Um, there's both overlap and differences between training and prevention. Um, and as we all learned just a few weeks ago with the official drop of the Title IX regulations, um, we're going to talk specifically about the who needs to be trained in the context of campus sexual violence in Title IX and some of the essential content of training, again, broadly um, for our uh, creating campus cultures as well as specific to the regulations. So um, that is the, the framing we bring today's conversation with. As Carrie said, we um, welcome questions through the chat and if uh, where appropriate, we can certainly bring people in um, to speak their questions. So if there's something complex that, that's on your mind, just make a note that you wanna ask a question. We wanna try and honor that and be as interactive as possible as well as um, providing, uh, we hope some helpful information for you today. So I'll start off. Um, if if we've met before, you know my role is in prevention, education, and at Vanderbilt. And so this is something I talk about a lot, um, but not everyone does. And a lot of people are coming from different roles um, to join us today. So we do like to lay a foundation um, before we dig in too deep to the intricacies of the new regulations, for example, um, or other challenges on our campus. And so where we are now, which may be very different from any prevention you might have received when you were a student or at different institutions, but where, where the field has really settled um, these days is with the public health approach. It's interdisciplinary, um, it's hopefully intersectional, and it has um, a, a broader community focus. And so we've wanted to shift from looking at individual risk factors um, and individual changes, which remain important, and, and we'll touch on those, but also the, the broader role of our relationships, our communities, um, and our society and how we can um, harness the power of those connections to better tackle the issue. Um, and so using this public health model, we do follow the traditional steps of defining the problem, considering and identifying those risk factors, what's contributing to prevalence, um, taking into consideration disproportionate impact in, in certain populations. And then, and this is really key, we want to use evidence-based approaches and assess our efforts with a broad-based appeal so that we have widespread adoption in our communities. So often you'll see in, in whatever curriculum you may be using or familiar with um, a diagram like this, and it's because it, it is so effective. And um, you may see it in other prevention efforts outside of sexual violence. The model is useful um, to, to many causes and to address um, many issues, many illnesses, many, many societal problems. And so this is one that's been adapted to sexual violence prevention work. And this can be a really persuasive tool for you when you go out and, and speak to others and try to um, bring in your stakeholders and convince sometimes reluctant members of our community that they do have a role to play. Um, whatever the issue is we're trying to tackle, you, you always encounter people who think that perhaps it is not their problem. So I like to, to use this model, which is um, very well regarded and established in the field, but it's not the only one, but it's useful to highlight everyone's role to play and the connections between these roles. And so you'll see that, yes, we, we take our individuals as we find them, we get a new um, class and new cohorts um, every semester, sometimes every academic year. And um, for, for some of them, you know, we need to start with some pretty basic training. Um, and then you'll, you'll find as you get to know your students or you get to know your colleagues, they'll tell you about issues that arise in their relationships, right? So we don't exist in isolation, um, even in quarantine conditions. Um, 
we exist in relation to those around us and it can be their romantic partners it can be their family it can be their colleagues it could be um, the organizations of which they're a part and that's impacting and influencing the ways in which people do or do not engage as bystanders the way they do or do not um, take consideration of their risk factors the structural conditions then around them that they may not be able to change by themselves right this model is giving us um, a process to work through and consider as we try to tackle the issue from a variety of ways, right? This is why comprehensive multi-pronged approaches to addressing sexual harassment and, and sexual assault in our communities is necessary. The relationships form our communities. We have smaller communities within the larger community of our campus, for example. And so are we thinking about different ways um, to use those different organizations and reach and meet the needs of those organizations when we're thinking about our largest campus, our larger campus community, right? So we have to really be um, intentional about reaching different populations in different ways, in culturally competent ways, in evidence-based ways, um, so that we're bringing everyone in to the larger effort. And, and all of the research from the public health model shows us that this is what's going to make our, our prevention efforts most successful on our campuses. I think the um, socioecological model in prevention is um, very much focused on the effort of a widespread campaign is to shift behavior and to shift behavior. It needs to cut across all aspects of this socio-ecological model in order to create change. Um, it's a culture shift and requires attention at all levels. And I think that's not dissimilar to when we talk about compliance with any of the civil rights-based protections, um, in this case, Title IX, it also takes attention at all levels. We want the individuals to understand behavioral expectations and policy and resources that are available. And at the other end of the spectrum, we wanna be thinking about the structures and systems that we're creating to make sure that they effectively serve everyone in the community towards that goal of shifting culture. So another way of considering our prevention efforts is using the prevention period, pyramid. And um, you'll hear about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. And some people have that vocabulary down and some people visit us um, a couple times a year and um, maybe no primary or awareness raising efforts, but um, then aren't thinking long-term which can be a struggle depending on the various resources um, and other factors in our respective communities. And so we wanted to give you a couple of visuals here on the next few slides to help you think about either building out your prevention effort program um, or filling any existing gaps um, and give you a, a lens towards your long-term goals. And so primary prevention is, you know, a lot of the awareness raising, a lot of teaching about prevalence. Um, this is where you can um, spend some time on those individual risk factors um, and try to prevent further harm from happening, right? So this is the effort to prevent an incident from occurring. And a lot of times our messages in primary prevention are, are more broad based, are general. Um, so a lot of what we tend to do uh, in online modules or in orientation sessions um, or tabling, for example, during awareness raising weeks would um, fall under the term of primary prevention. Secondary is crucially important, and a lot of us are doing this. So a lot of our bystander education or bystander intervention programs um, are really getting right at this secondary prevention phase or, or step. And what we want to do is sort of survey the scene and we see where the risk factors are. And this is where you can certainly acknowledge that not everyone is facing the same risk factors and not every environment um, is, is looking the same. And also not all of our bystanders are going to feel similarly equipped to intervene in, in different environments. Um, and so here is where you wanna consider a lot of different efforts to either disrupt um, prevent, reduce um, an incident of sexual harassment or violence, either right before it occurs, as it's occurring, but then also the immediate aftermath. The steps we take there send messages. Um, they can either 
appear to condone or tolerate the behavior, not take it seriously if we don't act appropriately. And that actually sends a message to others about what um, people can get away with, whether they're safe here, whether they belong here. So this is a really um, significant phase that is important to at least build upon if you're already doing primary uh, prevention efforts, which right there, you know, the bottom of the pyramid, um, as you're building out a more comprehensive program. And many of us are already doing this, um, I know, and both of these things should likely continue just in perpetuity on our campuses. And then we have tertiary um, at the top of our pyramid here. And um, this this is is not one that we can not address, right? So our prevention efforts are, are really going to be failed if we don't eventually get here, right? So a lot of people start and you gotta start somewhere. Fair enough. But they start by building um, from the bottom of the pyramid up, but this is a crucial phase, right? And so um, it's something that you've got to get to, you've got to think through how we are supporting survivors and holding offenders accountable. Both of those efforts are crucial and tell us actually through the research that taking both of those steps um, jointly and, and separately are key to communicating messages through your campus that in turn support your prevention efforts. When we hold offenders accountable, we discourage future perpetration of the harms. As we support survivors, for one thing, then they stay at our institutions, right? So we don't have that um, employee turnover or transfer student issue. Um, please note, a lot of transfer students are impacted in one way or another by sexual misconduct. There's really, um, serious data coming in on um, how many of our transfer students have experienced sexual misconduct at their prior institutions. And sometimes we're just not considering that as we work to integrate them into our community. And when we are supporting survivors, community member, but again, if we think right back to the social ecological model, uh, just word of mouth is going to um, help convey that we're taking this seriously, but also help the friends and family members, the fellow students of those survivors feel supported on our campuses. And so um, the pyramid works for some people, but I like to highlight that these efforts must continue. They might end up being a cycle, but here's another way to look at um, the continuous nature of our prevention efforts. And so it, it can be in phases um, and it should be continuous. And you might be dealing with different populations on your campus in, in different ways and at different times simultaneously, right? So you can have these phases going and that's how we really convey to the members of our community that we care about this issue. So many institutions say we take sexual assault seriously. This is how we mean it. This is how we show it with sincerity is when we have built out um, these efforts and devote enough resources for the people who are tasked with these issues on your campus to really deliver. Amy, do you wanna weigh in? I just think that whether you're looking at the pyramid or the spectrum that's here on the screen now, I think that some people overlook how tertiary prevention is our response. Our response is our policy and our process is part of prevention. Um, and often there's a tendency to hold them somehow apart. There's the prevention stuff and then there's what we do if something bad happens. And if we can think in a more um, robust and, and holistic way, then we are seeing how we respond is part of prevention. And I think that um, shift in mindset becomes even more critical when we are looking at the current landscape of everyone needing to revise and review our approach to our process. How do we keep in mind that, yes, there's there's lots of heavy lifting we need to do this summer to look at our procedures to be compliant with the new regulations and, and everything else that's happening in the landscape. And if we can keep our, our, um, our focus open to the reality that what we create it with regard to response is part of our prevention. So um, I have always found this helpful to, to really um, tie together uh, very strongly how what we put in writing and how we respond to an individual incident is part of the institutional prevention effort. 
And then as we transition to training, and again, training is prevention, and I feel like I say this all the time, that I live in a both-and world. There's lots of times where we um, people want to think about, well, is it this or that? And so many times in this work that we're doing, it's both and. Um, training is prevention, and training has some unique elements to it. So it's specifically at the level of training is about not just um, efforts to change behavior, but providing really specific information about how, um, not just what, which is the awareness building and the knowledge building, but the how do we go about doing whatever it is we're training about. Um, training should uh, have an intended audience and be really clear about um, what it is that we expect of the audience that we're reaching with training. Um, and remembering that compliance outlines those things we must do, um, we may do more, and our hope in changing campus culture is that we will strive higher and look at prevention efforts that aim higher than what we need to do. Um, so looking at training as um, an element of prevention, but a unique element of prevention. When we begin to think about the current regulations as they released, when we talk about staff training, um, I, the parenthetical there of Title IX personnel is because it's very specifically defined in the regulations. Um, to be clear, there is lots of staff training that uh, we'll be responsible for, and there's some very specific training um, within the regulations. We need to develop knowledge and skills um, as well as uh, information that needs to be shared specific to the role that someone is in. Um, we create a potential for the need to distance a little bit some of the aspirational prevention, as, as Tara talked about, the, the base of the uh, pyramid, if you will, is um, often much more aspirational and community expectations. And then as we talk about um, specific policy language, it necessarily narrows things of, you know, we, we expect an awful lot. We will hold accountable for some very specific violations. Um, and what becomes important in approaching training as an element of prevention is being really clear about where prevention and policy may not be exactly the same that we are, um, when we need to use different language or when we're talking aspirationally that we're clear that and there are very specific things that are covered within our policy and process. So that may be a point to um, consider with further um, exploration after our conversation today is where are the points where we know there's a difference in the messaging and might we need to emphasize that in a different way um, to help acknowledge there are times that there are inconsistencies and there are other points where we want to make sure we're consistent. Um, our investigator training and our institutional um, policies need to talk about um, protections being built in uh, against uh, inappropriate internal or external pressures and how do we train people um, to use the training, but with their decision-making models and their best practice minds, not um, that people were training people exactly what to do as if it happens in a vacuum. Um, I think those are important thoughts as we begin to think about not just what we're providing information on, but the how, the tools that we're providing um, for our Title IX personnel. Within the regulations that were released, it specifically talks about um, training staff to conduct effect effective response, and that's um, everything from intake through the uh, hearing process that's now required. That provides some foundation of knowledge and skill building that needs to be a part of the conversation. There's also going to be some very specific to an institution. What are the terms as they're defined in your campus policy? Um, what are the resources that are available? All of us can talk about we provide um, support resources and the importance of at every step in a process that we are reminding a participant about available resources, but on a specific campus, we need the greater detail about what are those resources. So um, being clear that we need both the general 
information and the process or site specific information, um, not dissimilar to, you know, we can all agree that documentation and record keeping is incredibly important. And in your campus based training, you're going to need to get down to the specifics of what are the tools that you use if you're a Maxient campus or an advocate campus, or you have some other um, data management tool. Um, are there things that you share using a Google Drive or through Box or some other tool? So thinking really comprehensively about some of the general expectations of how and the really specific um, how that may need to be a part of your campus based training. I think this um, creates an added challenge with the, the opportunities that ODHE provides that can uh, maximize information shared to schools across the state of Ohio. And we need to supplement that with campus specific training when it comes to the how of a campus policy and procedure. Kara, anything you would add to that before we look at the um, regulations specifically? Um, you know, I'm just always thinking <laughs> about the new regs these days, and um, I, I'm hearing from people that they're very worried, but it's giving you really specific instruction, as Amy said, about your Title IX coordinator and your Title IX personnel. I can tell you in the terms of the prevention efforts where I'm raising awareness for primarily students, but all members of my community, it's not giving instructions as saying, I have to change the content of that. And a really concrete example would be bystander intervention. We hope that we offer bystander intervention training and that people take the information and the skills building and do it. We don't in our conduct policy require them to do that, right? So this is not a divide that, that many of us aren't familiar with already. We're, we're teaching these aspirational behaviors. We have a lot of healthy relationships programming um, that comes out of my center, that's not going to be something that's in our Title IX policy, and the new regulations are just drawing this line um, a little more clearly, but it doesn't mean that you can't do the prevention things that you've been doing or use your existing curriculums. You know, um, hopefully they weren't based on sex stereotypes, hopefully they were based on data, um, and the new regulations won't be complicating your prevention efforts as, as much as some people I've noticed out there are, are worried about right now. Sure. And the language on the screen, the actual text of uh, just over 200 words from the 2020 regulations, um, the heading just to give us pause of the impartially impartiality and mandatory training of Title IX personnel. And we're going to unpack all of this, but just that line of the impartiality and mandatory training. So clearly there are things we have to do. We need to unpack the, the who is it that we need to do this for and what is it that we need to do. And so we really need to get into not just this language of what the regulation says, but digging into the, the rest of the 2000 pages of discussion about how the regulations came to be. Um, if you didn't already receive it, you will receive from Carrie a document that has a number of lines from the um, various discussion within the new regulations document that help support some of the common questions. Um, but to begin that unpacking process, so who is your Title IX personnel? Specifically, you're going to need to decide on your campus who are the actual names of the people who fit these roles. But explicitly in the regs, it indicates it's the Title IX coordinator or coordinators. So you do need to make sure any of your deputy coordinators are a part of training. Um, investigators, whether singular or plural. Decision makers is intentionally plural because in response to comments on the proposed regulations, the regulations discussion says we are making it decision makers plural because we recognize we don't want the same person making decisions in multiple ways. So there is a decision outcome and sanction decision maker and if you have an appeals process, it needs to be a different decision maker at the appeals level. I highlight that for two reasons. One is, I know in my experience on multiple campuses, 
our appeals folks are often pretty high level folks, either the, the VPSA or some vice president of HR, or other um, vice president level folks, often with lots of experience in the field. And that often translated into a tendency to believe, you know, I've got this, I've been there before, I don't need the training. If it comes up, I can handle it. The regulations are explicitly stating an appeals level decision maker must be among the folks who receive the Title IX personnel training. And finally, the, probably one of the more challenging pieces of the new regs is persons who facilitate informal resolutions. And that becomes a really ambiguous and um, we're all still trying to figure out who are those folks and at what point does that come into play. Um, but this is the group that one step for each of us to be working on while we're thinking about creating new policy and procedure is who are the people, the actual, not just the roles, but on your campus or your campuses, who are the people who now need to receive training because we need to be more careful about consistency of what training we're providing because these regulations are specifying this training that's provided to all of these individuals who are part of the team. And the second part of this is, and those materials need to be made available upon request for inspection by members of the public by making it available on your website if your school has a website. Um, so this is a, a pretty big requirement to have to post your training material. And there's a whole lot more detail in that of um, what that means of, um, there's another piece that says you need to keep it for seven years. We don't believe that means you need to post seven years worth of training, but each year the most current training needs to be publicly available and you need to have a way of, if somebody wanted to see how is this different from last year or three years ago, in a few years, they'll be able to ask for that. But beginning August 14th of this year, we need to post the training for the Title IX personnel that meets all of the other things we're gonna talk about in the elements of training. Um, so that's an awful lot uh, to begin with. And as the in the early days of the release of the regulations, a number of entities sent questions to the Open Center trying to clarify um, this, and then what came out of that is the um, OCR blog post from May 18th that begins to unpack it for us. What is it that um, the school is uh, in need of? Um, so this begins to spell out um, the definition of sexual harassment, and that needs to be in compliance with the regulation as defined. Um, the scope of the school's education program and activity. Um, this is a, a big one because we, particularly private institutions, may take jurisdiction for things outside of um, what we have to. We have a, um, an honor code of some sort or community expectations. We have a strong commuter or town gown expectation that behavior that happens at your personal apartment, but in our neighborhood, um, those are things that a school can still decide. And we need to be really clear about what meets the um, Department of Education definition of a school's education program or activity, because the requirements become pretty specific around that. Um, there are a number of points that that comes up in the regulations. We need to train on how to conduct an investigation and a grievance process. And those few words in one line on the screen are probably where the bulk of a lot of our training is going to come from when we think about how to effectively conduct an investigation and implement the grievance process as written on your campus. I think the investigation part, most of us have a number of years worth of providing that training and participating in training about um, how to be prompt and equitable and trauma informed and all of the things we want to be in how we approach individuals in that investigation process. We're all going to need to do some retraining when it comes to the grievance process specifically. Um, the next two are really big and amorphous of how do we serve impartially, avoiding prejudgment of facts. 
and how do we avoid conflicts of interest and bias? And I'm going to pause here because I, I'll, I'll share a little bit and turn to Kara to see what she may want to share. Um, again, not a lot of words there, but an awful lot of meaning that we need to unpack in there. What makes us impartial? Clearly what's repeated in the discussion in the regs is avoiding prejudgment of facts. And so that becomes, how do we train that? How do we encourage folks that part of our training and experience is a healthy skepticism that trust but verify? Um, and how do we do that in a way that remains the neutrality of we're taking in all of the information and we're not making a judgment um, at the point of hearing it. And for some of us, it might, might not ever be our role to make a judgment of the facts if we're not the decision maker. And so the impartiality piece of how do you, how do you talk about that? How do you train that with your community? And then when we think about conflicts of interest and bias, what is not mentioned in the regulations or very often in the discussion is, are we talking about actual conflict of interest or bias or perceived conflict of interest or bias? We talk about that a lot on campuses and in the work that we do. The regulations are fairly silent on that. And so there is going to be a need on your campus to make some decisions about who is the arbiter of, is it a conflict of interest or has there been bias? And how do you go about doing that? As with all of this, the more we can think about that, that kind of question before the need arises, the easier it's going to be to have a framework to think about. And um, for many of us on campuses that are um, relatively small or uh, resource strapped, there are often people wearing multiple hats, which inherently can raise a question of where is the line for conflict and bias? Um, one of the um, examples that comes to mind for me around that question is that having worked on a campus with um, a pool of investigators who served in other roles as their full-time job, but they were trained to be investigators, part of that investigator training included, there is both an opportunity for individuals to self-identify a concern about conflict of interest or bias based on a type of circumstance or specific um, details of a case as well as the responsibility of the Title IX coordinator to look for and select participants in the um, personnel pool based on reducing the likelihood of conflict of interest or bias. And I had a, an investigator who um, maybe a quarter of the way into an investigation got an updated list of witnesses and called me as the um, Title IX coordinator and said, I have a concern and I need to figure out whether this presents a conflict of interest. When uh, that investigator received a list of witnesses, they identified there was a witness on the list who knew the investigator's partner. And that raised appropriately a red flag for the investigator. Ooh, there's this connection between that witness and me personally. I wonder if that's a conflict. My immediate question for that person was, well, the witness has knowledge of your partner. How often do you talk to your partner about the work that you do as an investigator, particularly any kind of specifics? And appropriately, the investigator said, no, not at all. We don't talk about that. Okay, good. Because if you're not sharing anything relevant about the case, that lowers the concern as to whether there's conflict. But we talked through whether there was conflict, both from the perspective of the investigator and from my perspective as the Title IX coordinator as they shared information. And then I created a documentation that I kept with the case records that indicated on the date that this the investigator came forward as soon as they saw the connection of that shared acquaintance that we talked through and we determined there was not a conflict of interest in that matter. And we tucked away 
that documentation so that if it had come up later, we could identify, well, yes, we talked it through here and here's why it was determined it was not an issue. Um, we had already had a structure of training our investigators. If they had any reason up front or during a process to believe there might be a conflict that could raise concern, that they should hit the pause button and have a conversation so we could talk through that. And in that particular example, it worked really well. It didn't delay anything. The investigator was able to continue, but we did our diligence because we had that process in place in advance. I think Amy highlights a really good point is, or it's a series of points is why I like working with her, um, where you can build a really broad pool of, of uh, people to serve in roles so that you have options up front. It'll just make um, the process easier if conflicts of interest or bias arises. Um, we build with an eye of perception of bias. We do, we take that into consideration at my institution. Um, and I think that I'm not alone at working at or with institutions who don't have um, fully established procedures for screening conflict of of interest. Um, I've worked at institutions where we just got an annual statement and we were supposed to click that we read it and that was the extent of it. And it was a, a lot of responsibility that was one sided on us to do a lot of things, but it wasn't clear about who you call, for example, or what would constitute a sufficient conflict. And the regs are pretty clear here that that um, kind of token compliance may not be sufficient. People need to know who to call. And it can be, if you've thought through it in advance, um, a phone call of screening. So it doesn't have to be an elaborate multi-step process or a process adjacent to your process that you're building, but it may need to be more than you've been doing. Interestingly enough, we might have built really good procedures in our student organizations and just have not yet adopted them for faculty and staff. Um, we have more of uh, more leverage in in telling our student organizations the rules that they have to follow. So um, I've worked at an institution where um, the the conduct procedures that were run by full time employees did not have clear conflict of, of interest. Um, procedures, but our student run honor council, for example, did right. There was a level of distrust um, and. And sometimes that, that makes sense, right? Because the students um, may make assumptions. We had students who were leaders in their Greek letter organizations who were saying, no, I'm the judicial officer over here. So I'm used to this. Don't worry. I can I can hear this case without um, prejudging or without bias, but we would want, right? A method of removal. And so it was actually easy for us to adopt from a student organization, these um, written out, right, like bylaw like procedures and apply it to existing professional offices with faculty and staff. So hopefully you don't have to start from scratch, but but be creative about where you can look to get some help in um, building out procedures, but then know that you need to communicate this clearly, right? So if it's as simple as like run it past your Title IX coordinator, tell your trainees that in the training so that they aren't sitting at their desk not knowing what to do because um, we see with reporting and um or, or failure to report or failure to um, you know excuse themselves from certain cases people telling us they had this moment where they didn't know what to do and then you know those are situations where if they've been better equipped hopefully they wouldn't make what sometimes is the wrong decision Thanks, Kara. And um, the other thing that is mentioned in the discussion related to the regs it is, um, while it doesn't strongly make the connection about cultural competence, the discussion really talks about um, there should not be bias such that uh, the uh, information that is used is um, either excludes anyone based on identity or impacts people differently based on identity. Um, the regs in discussion don't have really strong language about bias from the sense of implicit bias and cultural competence, but that is absolutely um, inferred through some of the discussion uh, within those many, many pages that, that uh, came with the regulations. So all of that uh, it should be a part of what's on our minds.
Um, the other thing that the regulations and this um, blog post do is point to some of the technical information. So as I noted earlier of um, being trained on the grievance process, which is really your campus-based grievance process, um, there's some more technical and um, broader based things like technically how to use the equipment that will be used for live hearings um, because we can allow for a means to see one another without being in the same room. Presumably we're gonna use technology for that. Whatever your campus-based technology is, the people who need to use it need to be trained how to use it. And you need to document how and when you've trained them on that. Um, Additionally, there are two different ways that there is expectation of, of training about relevance, um, relevance of questions and relevance of evidence, and very specifically relevance as it relates to um, what is referred to as the rape shield protections uh, in a couple of places in the regulations. So how do you talk about in the investigation process and in the hearing process, what it means to consider relevance? Are the questions relevant? Why or why not? Um, and what evidence is relevant? How was that determined and communicated? Um, and then in addition to that is investigators must receive training on issues of relevance to create an investigative report that fairly summarizes relevant evidence. Um, our English teachers would be horrified that we're using relevant in the same sentence in the way that it's written, but that's OCR's language from the blog post of it's both how do we consider the relevance and how do we create the investigation report that makes that clear. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to unpack in there into the training that needs to be provided and not just provided, but we also need to make all of those materials available on our websites. Um, as Carrie said at the beginning of, of today's call, she's recording this session. She's going to share this information. The slides either have been or will be um, shared with you all. We are aware, Kara and I as presenters, that this information will likely end up on some people's websites as training that was provided to at least some of your Title IX personnel. Um, this to me was important to point out, A, to make sure people don't miss that we need to, if you weren't already keeping good records about what kind of training is, is received by your Title IX personnel, now we really need to, effective August 14th, and most people are interpreting this to say, we know we're going to be getting training before August 14th that is to inform what we do effective August 14th. So we do want to keep those records and may need to post things like this session, um, depending upon how you interpret the regulations. But another lens on that for many of you who either outsource your training, hire a consultant to come in, you're going to want to look at your consultant contracts real carefully to make sure that there is an agreed upon understanding about how you can use the materials from those training sessions. Every consultant out there recognizes this regulation as well, and I think you'll start start seeing some very specific language around how material can be shared and in what way um, it is to be used. And also for those of us who in our staff roles may create training for our folks, we need to create training recognizing that the materials we create are going to be made publicly available. Um, I think for those of us who do this work from the lens of, of an investigator or a decision maker, we're used to be careful what you say and do because it could be either tomorrow's headline or what you have to share in deposition. So if you would make it a headline or say it in deposition, it's okay to say. Um, now that kind of extends to our training as well. Um, are we creating our training materials in a way that it conveys what we think a viewer who didn't sit through our training is going to take from it? For me, this is a real um, challenge with, I appreciate the intention of this part of the regulation is to help people um, show and demonstrate how they provide um, appropriate training for Title IX personnel. 
but I know I've got a whole bunch of slides from things I've either provided or participated in that if I hadn't been there, something would be missing. Um, and so it really changes the way we think about the materials we create and, and how they're going to be viewed by someone who wasn't actually in the room for the training. So um, I, I think the as, as the theme for today seems to be a holistic or comprehensive look at, at all of the things that, that we do, I don't want to um, overstate the importance, but it, I think it is really important to think about the training materials that will need to be made publicly available and what messages that sends. Anything you would add to that, Kara? I think this is the point where I'm feeling like, I know people might feel overwhelmed that in the midst of everything that is going on, we also have a brand new lengthy set of regulations. Um, and the, the thing to know is that your colleagues on this call, many of us nationwide are in the same uh, situation where we are working through the document. But we're a few weeks in, so we're getting some good tools put out by professional associations and organizations. Um, and you can, we will be using those. You can work through those. Um, you know, we're going to get some checklists, I'm sure. Um, and that's certainly a place to start. As um, I was working through the regs, really from the prevention and victim advocacy lens, which is what my uh, day job calls for. I found a lot of efforts that um, are calling for greater transparency. And this is an opportunity where, yes, we do have to be more specific um, and, and uh, write our slides carefully, for example. Um, but these are opportunities to, to increase our transparency, which can help us build greater trust. And so, yes, it's calling for work, right? We're gonna have to be thoughtful. We're gonna have to put work in, but there, there are some opportunities um, in these new regulations here to, to build greater trust, which many of our institutions need. Um, and there's some specifics that are, that are causing concern, like one on the slide right here, right? Must not rely on sex stereotypes. I've talked to people who are like, is that saying we can't talk about sex or gender identity? That's not saying you can't talk about gender identity. It's saying don't rely upon stereotypes. Um, and so this is also now an opportunity if you haven't been diligent about this in the past, when I hope you have, but some, you know, some of us has many hats, right? So it's hard to do all of the things, but this is an opportunity to review your existing curricula for inclusivity and um, changing some old language that maybe we were using even five years ago that that is not landing well with with our current students. So, yes, there's work, but there there are some potential payoff, you know, in the end from the regulations, kind of no matter what you're hearing about them or how you were feeling about them in their proposed form. Um, I'm finding things to work with, but I do think um, that when we post stuff publicly, um, we're going to have an opportunity to point to that um, and for people to see what we are doing, which sometimes is a story that's been difficult to tell in ways that I'm hopeful that can help us in the long run build uh, trust across our populations on our campuses. So coming back to the regulations language specifically and unpacking um, the having to train folks how to conduct an investigation and a grievance process. Um, some of the language that comes out of the regulations and discussions, um, really important to look at the terminology that's used in the regulations. So, uh, whereas a year ago, I think there was starting to be some fluidity of campuses were choosing different terms for uh, a complainant and respondent or a reporting party and a responding party and um, some different ways of using those terms that were may have been campus specific, the regs are really using complainant and respondent explicitly. And so campuses are going to need to decide, is it easier to use the language of the regulations and change or change back or adjust in our own procedures? And if we're not, how do we reconcile that and make sure we're really clear in our training, both for most importantly for that Title IX personnel team to receive uh, effective information, but also so that um, what 
third parties of whatever constituency they are who may look at our training, is it going to be clear to them that we have complied with the regulations? And then as I think Kara was alluding to, um, for all of us to continually remind ourselves, we can comply and do more and be uh, strive for best practice. We just need to make sure we're also um, hitting each of those points that the regulations require. And when it comes to the grievance procedures, this um, 106.45B goes on with some really specific elements of what a grievance procedure needs to include. So we do need to sit with those regulations and make sure not just in writing our procedure do we hit those points from a compliance perspective, but also in our training for our Title IX personnel are we hitting on all of those things? Um, and again, just we'll say over and over again, yes, we need to be compliant and we can still do more and in a way that is in alignment with the values and mission of our institution. And we probably need to pay some close attention to coming back again and making sure we're compliant with some of those details. Um, and as, as mentioned, the really specific for de decision makers to be trained on issues of relevance, um, there's going to be a lot of different lenses for looking at that, at, at where are the thresholds of um, how we ask a question. Um, it may be that we need to uh, get clarification from a party or a witness to understand what the relevance is and how are we keeping records at each stage where one of the Title IX personnel is needing to determine something was or was not relevant, where do we document? How do we keep clear records as to, yes, it was asked and here's why we determined it was not relevant. Some of that is gonna end up within your investigation report. Some of that is gonna be record keeping that the um, Title IX coordinator needs to make sure process notes are being maintained that give you a, a way to go back and say, yes, the question was asked, but here's why we didn't allow it, because that might not be apparent in an investigation report, but if there were a Title IX complaint at the federal level or litigation of any sort, you would need to produce those records. So um, I think there's some additional layers of um, not just training, but training in the minutia of Again, we, we have been pretty good about how to write a good report that is neutral and uses neutral language and cultural, culturally competent language and presents the facts fairly. And now we've got some minutia of what sorts of record keeping needs to be maintained um, and where or in what way to continue to comply with um, meeting all of these things. Um, I think there are points in the regulations that also um, may sound really simple. Training on the definition of sexual harassment, which we mean is the definition in 106.30. And I think you also need to train your folks on a broader spectrum of definitions because the vast majority of us, maybe all of us, are going to have there's the Title IX definition that we have to have that meets this 106.30. And here are some other behaviors that are problematic and how they'll be addressed, whether you choose to do that through a gender-based misconduct policy or referring certain types of um, harassment or behaviors that are problematic but don't meet this definition would get referred to a code of conduct or some other mechanism. That's going to take a different kind of training um, to make sure that the people in the process understand how are those decisions being made on your campus as to what meets the definition of this Title IX required process versus what meets the definition of something problematic under our policy and may or may not be following the same process of response. I saw you take some notes. Is there anything you were going to add in there? Not at this time. 
<laughs> always like to make sure. No, thank so you though. I, I come back to you because I know we have provided a tremendous amount of information and I um, did not give the disclaimer up front that folks may um, walk away from this with as many questions as answers or some people might say more questions than they entered with. Um, I, that that is the nature of having all of this information to uh, to work with and be so new to us from the regulations perspective. But I think it's also important um, to come back to the regulations speak to specifically campus response to sexual misconduct and in some ways even narrower than that. And within the discussion of the regulations document, it makes clear that there are other aspects of our Title IX obligations that are not addressed in the 2020 regulations. And when that's the case, we do need to look at existing information. The 2001 sexual harassment guidance, although its title says guidance, it also went through a notice and public comment period. It also has the force of law. There are things addressed in that document about prevention and educating staff about recognizing adverse behavior and knowing how to refer people, that is still our responsibility, even though the 2020 regulations really don't talk about that. And in fact, some of the discussion says that's not our focus, but we don't think that these regulations prohibit people from giving whatever training they think their community needs. Um, so you may find in your own campus that um, Others on campus are really focused on how do we comply with the 2020 regulations? Yes, and let's not forget we still have other things we need to be compliant with. And in addition to that, there's the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization of the Clery Act that requires some really specific training and education, both for the response folks and the members of our community. And schools that have any kind of athletics, but specifically NCAA obligations, and I think some of the other um, athletic entities are starting to at least talk about, if not impose, some expectations of what other sorts of training and education do we need to be providing to our community that is in addition to and, and should be complementary to the training that we're talking about from the regs that's specifically training staff how to um, proceed with an investigation and grievance process. Um, so we want to remind folks to be sure to look at um, all of the existing guidance and regulations. The other one that comes up um, that some folks uh, uh, forget about is the 2015 Title IX Coordinator Resource Guide was not rescinded. Other things that were issued in 2015 around the same time were rescinded. That guide, resource guide was not rescinded. So it still serves as guidance. If there's anything in that guidance that conflicts with the 2020 regulations, the new regulations overrule it. But the vast majority of that document is about other aspects of our Title IX obligations that aren't mentioned in the 2020 regulations. So these are just some tools to think about that because we're very much focused on what is the training we're providing our Title IX personnel for um, investigation and response. Don't forget about or don't let anyone tell you that we don't need to continue doing all of this other um, both prevention and training. Um, we still want someone who has an adverse experience to know how to report, to know what resources are available and how to access those resources. That means we need to train other people on campus with that important information. Um, that again is is the both and world. It's not um, we're going to do training of the Title IX personnel and therefore not think about the other information, but comprehensively thinking about how do we pay attention to our training and continue a robust uh, prevention effort that looks at the three tiers or um, the spectrum of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention elements. The regulations, the 2000 page document actually has a lot in the discussion about how to work with the NCAA guidelines um, or the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine report that came out and that if your institution is a member of their action collaborative. So it acknowledges that these um, broader efforts are going on and uh, is telling us in, in the discussion and the executive summary um, 
exactly what Amy was just saying, right? That there are ways to, to do both, right? And um, people are worried about what equity means. It's, it's a word that we toss around a lot, but the regs tell us also over and over um, for, for them, for Title IX, equity means, you know, supportive measures for the complainant and a fair process um, for the respondent. And so some of the um, headlines again, and some of the people I've talked to are, are really thinking that you we have to overhaul everything. Um, and there are things that, that we might have to change. There are some big changes that, that are going to impact campuses. But um, when you dig in there, you'll see that there are things that you don't have to change, right? And so know that it is really specific, as we've highlighted, because we think it's important um, that these specifications for training are respective to things that meet definitions under Title IX and people involved in those Title IX procedures. But it doesn't mean that we can't um, continue engaging in the prevention efforts um, that we've been engaging in or that we can't continue to be partners um, with professional associations um, or follow continue in efforts with the AAU, for example, or the national academies or the, the different associations to which we may belong. So when we talk about um, broadly our prevention and training, both words are powerful and um, we want to uh, make sure that we continue to emphasize that. And as we said early on in today's conversation, where there may be things that are um, what we can say in our procedures is going to be much narrower than the way we talk about our aspirations of how people treat one another in a relationship, for example. And we just want to be clear and make sure that people who are delivering both prevention and response know where there is overlap, as well as recognizing um, where um, that overlap is less apparent. So we want to think about when we're communicating about Title IX, our communication, the language we use needs to be age appropriate. And if you think about a primarily residential undergraduate uh, campus that is traditional age college students, there's going to be language and presentation there that may be different than a university system that has uh, undergraduate programs, professional studies, a law school, a medical school, any other so sort of um, master's programs, we need to make sure that we are reviewing our materials from each of the lenses that are appropriate audiences for it. And we want to make sure we're training the people who do the work, as well as educating our community, and in some cases, training people about how to access the resources that are available, um, making sure we're always thinking about um, how do we reach our audience where they are? Um, we want there to be prompt and equitable response in our communications and being uh, more clear. While the, the current regulations don't require what does it mean to be prompt and equitable, it does say we have to define that. What does that mean on your campus? So while you might not say within 15 days we will do X, Y, or Z, there are some places within our Title IX process, the grievance process does need to allow a minimum of 10 days for review. So there needs to be some definition of what does prompt and equitable mean and how do you explain that in a way that makes sense to the folks who are responsible for the process and anyone who might be participating in the process. And we generally want to make sure all of our materials and training is accessible and accessible in every sense of that word, accessible to English language learners or international students, visiting students, um, accessible from a disabilities perspective. If you're putting things into a PDF format, is it a PDF format that is properly programmed for e-readers? Um, if you're using information or flowcharts, things that can be helpful, how do you have an equivalent to that flowchart that is helpful for someone who may be vision impaired? Um, and thinking about accessibility for those with any type of trauma history. Um, and this is where I, I give my caveat that trauma-informed training has been a buzzword that some people get really scared because um, there are some who would say that's a bad thing and you can't do that. As Kara explained earlier, um, when we talk about 
gender stereotypes, trauma-informed training itself is not banned. It's doing that responsibly. And so trauma-informed training, from my perspective as I'm using it here, is to look at we won't ever know the trauma history of everyone that we interact with. If we approach every point of engagement, recognizing that someone could have a trauma history, that helps us treat everyone with dignity and respect and recognize that the stressfulness of participating in a process or needing to come forward as a witness or being accused of something, if there's a trauma history, it might really impact the recall of knowing or hearing what's being presented to me. So thinking about accessibility of if I provide something in writing following a conversation, the purpose of that is to help people recall from what we said. They're seeing it in writing to help support understanding of those important elements. So all of these, when we're communicating about any aspect of our Title IX obligations or meeting our Title IX obligations, whether we're talking to the personnel who are doing this work or people who need to access um, the resources and response that we provide, are we doing that in a clear way with age appropriate language and in a way that is accessible with all of these things in mind? That's part of supporting um, effective communication about this really complex work that we're doing. And this slide is very similar intentionally. You need to know your audience. You need to adjust your language. Here is where you have room to appeal to community standards um, or existing community creeds that, that you may have. And this can be aspirational. And that is probably not new. You've probably been doing this. Um, we just haven't had perhaps on some campuses as clear lines drawn as about what is this versus this. And as we've shown you with the diagram at bottom, sometimes there's overlap and sometimes there's not, and that is okay. Um, and so I, I, I worry about the fear that comes um, from the uncertainty of, of what are the final, what's the final rule going to say? When is it going to drop? What can we do? That sometimes causes um, us to freeze or to change things that we don't have to. This is a high liability area. I've seen that also. Um, prompt institutions to sometimes um, move very slowly or so carefully that they're really afraid to let their prevention um, team talk about a full range of subjects. The regs are not saying that you need to um, react in that way. And when you're coming from the prevention and we, we believe strongly in a trauma-informed approach, which the discussion around the regulations also um, touches on and says that when done appropriately, when when based on the research, when drawn from evidence-based approach, uh, approaches that it's not harmful to respondents to also build in trauma-informed um, tactics and, and care in, in your procedures. And so I, I urge you not to abandon that. There um, is acknowledgement that for our respondents, this can be a very, very trying time and, and trying process to go through. Um, and with, as, as Amy said, thankfully, an, an approach or an assumption that we do not know how we find our students and what they're bringing with us, um, you don't have to adopt a, a kind of cold demeanor or building a wall to convey um, that you're free from bias, we can take everyone who's coming in, witnesses as well, because this is daunting for them too, um, and, and treat them with care and dignity and hear what they have to say. This, this, There's overlap here in not prejudging um, the facts or the narrative, you know, and, and this can be good for all of us involved and really help improve satisfaction rates regardless of who the person is in the process with our process. So I uh, want to point to the Venn diagram on the lower right of the screen. The, what we're really trying to emphasize is the overlap of training and prevention, as well as recognizing where there is some divergence. Um, and an example that is highlighted in the current regulations is 
The regulations specify the jurisdiction or where the behavior occurs is an important element of whether something is quote unquote Title IX or not. That doesn't mean we're not going to address it under our process, but how something is addressed may be very specifically um, tied to where something occurred. That's important when we're training the Title IX personnel. But your prevention people are not going to go out and say, you really need consent anytime you're on our campus. Like that that's where clearly when we talk about consent, we probably do need to get our prevention people to at least acknowledge where the behavior occurs could influence the process under which matters are addressed, whatever the language is, so that we're not going so far out of in an aspirational place with prevention that someone is surprised if they come forward to the equity office with a complaint. But I think that point is a really good example of where that overlap of training and prevention, we need to be cognizant of how we talk about consent in our policy and what that means for response. And that when we talk about consent from a prevention lens, we're not going to talk about where it happens, but we need to acknowledge that where it happens could make a difference when you go to seek recourse. Um, so I think that um, there are a couple of points through uh, the definitions that that we um, provide and what level of accountability when we might be um, inclined to consider an informal resolution or an educational response as opposed to being required to conduct an investigation. Those are some um, examples of where it might be helpful to think more critically. Yes, we need to train or retrain our Title IX personnel, but what might we need to make clear with our prevention efforts that that thread is still there, even though we might talk more broadly from a prevention lens, we're keeping the thread of here's how that connects back into our response and um, what might be expected when you do uh, make a disclosure through official channels. And then again, I think because um, I'm a fan of the Venn diagrams and looking at all of the complexity, um, I provide this overlapping diagram in part to remind all of us, this is indeed really complex stuff we're talking about. There's a whole lot of um, information to begin with. And then the um, obligations from the Department of Education under Title IX from the Clery Act and the way VAWA amended Clery, the Title VII considerations that overlap any NCA or other sports obligations and the things that we agree to with ODAG for changing campus culture. What I find really helpful with this diagram is sometimes there are other folks on campus who um, question why we need to do something. Well, I read this article about the regs and it says that you shouldn't be talking about gender stereotypes. So why are you talking about gender identity? Well, A, those are two different things. And let's look at all of the regulations, not just one regulation. I also have found this uh, diagram is adapted from one that was created back in 2014. Um, uh, Ballard Spar actually is where I first um, was introduced to it when we were just beginning to understand the VAWA um, amendments to the Clery Act, and it was just uh, three uh, circles in the Venn diagram at that point. We're now up to six and probably could put a couple more in there with Title VI and other things that really do have some overlap with this. Um, but I found that the Venn diagram was really helpful in training staff who don't do this work all the time. For them to see as the Title IX coordinator or a member of the Title IX team, however that's approached on your campus, we need to look at all of these things and figure out how that informs each of these steps of the process or the things that we're talking about. Um, and this can appropriately give context to the complexity of everything that we need to do that can sometimes um, grant us a little bit of space from people who are questioning us and think they know, but they, they aren't familiar with all of this. Um, and in some cases, this can really help 
um, folks who aren't involved in it, but go, oh yeah, I guess there is a whole lot more to this than, than I realized. Let me sit down and listen to, to what we have to share. So um, I think this overlap is um, just a tool that you may find helpful as well as you may find helpful to use in other places. I know we um, wanted to uh, come to some concluding thoughts to try and make sense of all of the information that we've shared. And I think one of the phrases that we haven't said specifically, but we've alluded to is how are we managing expectations, um, both of the um, team that we're training between prevention educators and those who are dealing with response for all of the various constituents in our community, um, making sure that we have an eye towards managing expectations throughout the process can be helpful. Um, Kara and I have both mentioned the importance of evidence-based approaches and assessing for effectiveness. That's part of a um, comprehensive approach from a sociological model that everything we do, we need to pay attention to what's working, what's not working, what can be improved upon from our own assessment, but also looking at as the field shifts and what can we learn from other people um, who are either publishing research or um, the, the reality of looking at case law and how the, what's been learned in other places may inform what we can do here. Um, thinking about how we can talk uh, about clarity in our community guidelines and expectations and clarity in our enforcement and our um, policy and process distinctly what is how can we be clear and how can we acknowledge where there is overlap because there is overlap um, and then the just incredible importance of how we document in every sense of that what records are we keeping with regard to the training we provide? What records are we keeping as we enter into any disclosure that may or may not become an investigation and a grievance process um, every step of the way through that process and the documentation within the process? How are we writing a report and um, looking for appropriate continuity in the format of a report regardless of how it, it is conducted who's uh, participating in that, as well as um, tailored to the specific uh, circumstances. So I think documentation is a, an enhanced responsibility within our training at this point. Um, and I think um, everything that we can do to reassure ourselves and our communities in this time that what we're really striving for is creating a community free from discrimination and harassment and a commitment to a fair process uh, in um, creating that environment and how we each have a role in that. So um, I think those are some broad takeaways. I'll pause and see. Carrie, is, uh, Kara, is there anything else you would add on um, those takeaways? Not on the takeaways, but I got to close with my like well-being message that like you know, we've we've just sat through um, over an hour talking about federal regulations. So for many people, that's not their idea of a good time. Um, there are a lot of reasons we might need to take care of ourselves. So as you work on your implementation, pause, stretch your body as you're able, take some deep breaths, drink a glass of water. These are things that I do. <laughs> day in and day out um, to do the work that, that Title IX um, and prevention and victim advocacy require. Um, we are just going to, to learn more and learn from other institutions and hopefully hear some more from the, the Department of Education in the coming weeks as we work alongside other schools and trying to implement this. Um, I am in Tennessee, so I'm not an Ohio expert, but I, anyone who wants to reach out can feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or via my email, and I am happy to tell you what we're doing as we work through it. Again, we hope that um, we've at least got the wheels turning and, and provided some resources both in this conversation and in the materials that um, Carrie will share with folks, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, trying to point you in the direction of some supporting content from the discussion in the regulations to help as um, we each navigate uh, all of the work that has been um, put forward for us as we enter into this unusual summer. Um, again, I'll echo what Kara described of how we take care of ourselves and one another in the process and um, 
hope that we won't hesitate to reach out and connect with one another and utilize the resources that ODHE provides and makes available throughout the year. Um, and to um, continue to thank all of you for the good work that's being done. Um, I think Ohio continues to be ahead of the curve in really providing some central information and really encouraging schools to access resources and connect with one another um, to, to grapple together with some of the challenges of, of changing campus culture. Well, thank you to both Amy and Kara. Thank you again for your time and your expertise today and for um, your willingness to help our campuses here in Ohio as they move forward. Um, I have not seen any questions in the chat room pop up, um, but if there's anybody who has a final question or two, now's the time. Um, as a reminder, I will send out at the conclusion of this webinar um, a copy of the slides from today, as well as I'll resend that worksheet um, that was sent out uh, prior to the start of this to um, those who registered by Friday. Um, I will resend that as well for you. If you'd like a copy of the recording, um, simply just email me directly and I'll be happy to provide that as well. So. Um, seeing no questions come in, Amy, Kara, thank you once again. Everybody else, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, I wish you all well and um, take care of one another. Thank you. Oh.